Okay, thanks everyone uh, for giving me the opportunity to present this uh, project on tracking Rodinia across um, mesopolis to neopolisoic boundary. So here we'll zoom in one billion years ago and to de develop a new pole uh, for low interest apparent polar on the path. And we're going to be working with uh, sediments as well. And we'll show how we deal with uh, incorporating the uncertainty of that factor into sedimentary pole in a second. <laughs> Um, to uh, to reconstruct the configuration development of supercontinent uh, Rodinia, we focus in this project on developing uh, paleogeographic constraints on uh, Laurentia, which is Cretonic North America. And because from geologic record we know Laurentia was bounded on all sides by late Neoproduct rifted passing margins, and we know other uh, cratons around uh, uh, around it. And here I'm showing a snapshot of the estimated reconstruction of paleogeography at circa 1070 MA, showing Laurentia at the center and other uh, 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 cratons around it. With, uh, here, okay. And then we know this uh, uh, paleogeography reconstruction at this time pretty well is, and that's because we have the, uh, the well-resolved uh, Kiyunaran track up here. And the Kiyunaran track uh, consists of a, a dense amount uh, of paleomagnetic poles with uh, high, high quality and also they're paired with uh, high precision geochronology. So on the left, I'm showing an example um, thermal demagization data on uh, the Mitchell-Cotton Island basalts, and we can see this uh, beautiful straight component, uh, origin trending component here after, uh, after thermal uh, demagization, and this data is in the magic contribution link. And this data is paired with high precision geochronology developed from uranium lead and zircon. And we can see this, uh, uh, these lava flows are bounded by uh, the West Sand Bay Tuff and, uh, uh, and the, uh, this, uh, this rhyolite. Um, and these uh, two units are uh, well dated to high precision within a million years. And such that the age of this uh, uh, Mishpikaden Island basalt are well, well constrained. And because of these high quality paleomagnetic data and geochronology data, we're able to reconstruct the paleogeography of Laurentia in late Mesoproterozoic. And starting here on the left, I'm showing the paleomagnetic pole in today's uh, continental, uh, today's coordinates, showing these poles are really close to North America. Ooh, out of, out of power. And in spin axis frame, if we reconstruct these paleomagnetic poles to the spin axis, we see Laurentia started off at circa 1109 MA to be at high latitudes. And in about 5 million year time snapshots, we can see that the paleomagnetic poles moved away from North America on the left, which means the continent was rapidly moving from high latitudes to low latitudes, and eventually toward the equator around 1075 MA and leading up to the Granvillian orogeny uh, between um, Laurentia and the Congeria continents. And here is our uh, record of um, paleomagnetic poles paired with this suite of high resolution geochronology data. And here I want to quote uh, the no, no date, no rate uh, from geochronologists. And with the such uh, uh, high resolution data in both time and paleomagnetic poles, we can calculate the uh, plate uh, motion speed for Laurentia during this time period. And here, if this uh, motion is described by Euler pole rotation, we can see the rotation rate is about three degrees per million years. And this maps onto about 30 centimeters per year uh, of uh, plate motion. And what this means is uh, from 1109 to about 10, 1075 MA, the Laurentia's plate speed was about two times as fast as Indian plate in the Cenozoic, and it's really fast plate motion. However, if we look back on the compilation of a parent polar wonder path of Laurentia in the late Proterozoic, we see we end the Kiwanawan track with the circa 1075 MA uh, non such poles here. And then the next well dated paleomagnetic pole. Uh, in Laurentia's uh, polar wonder path would be the 775 MA Gumbarodeck paleomagnetic pole. And thus we have a 300 million years um, of gap. We do have this suite of poles from the Grenville um, province, but to date these poles, 
uh, we need to um, follow the more difficult um, task of dating the exhumation of the origin. And so in the rest of this talk, I want to focus on developing new geochronology and paleomagnetic data from the Jacobsville formation. Um, uh, Roy and Robertson in 1978 developed some paleomagnetic data, uh, but at the time there was a lack of geochronology and a lack of paleomagnetic field tests to constrain the age of this pole. And so in recent years, there has been um, effort in developing new age constraint for uh, the Jacobsville formation. And so uh, Malone et al. in 2016 used relatively low precision to try to zerk on uh, uranium lead techniques to date uh, the maximum deposition age of the Jacobsville formation. And they conclude that this, uh, the younger zircons uh, have a age, mean age of 959 plus minus 19 MA. And um, they used uh, the pale latitude record of Laurentia incorrectly by mapping um, the pale latitude of the Jacobsville uh, sandstone developed by Roy and Robertson onto absolute uh, pale latitude um, axes. And then uh, said, the age of the uh, Jacobsville formation has to be younger than 800 MA on this plot. Uh, but uh, we can update the age of the Jacobsville, Jacobsville formation uh, with high precision geochronology, and also we can conduct a paleomagnet test to further test the robustness of that pole. And so the Jacobsville formation is this tan color formation in the interior Laurentia. Uh, in the Mekong Rift, but it is a post-rift sedimentary package uh, I'll show in the cross-section here. So in the cross-section, we can see that the Mekong uh, Rift volcanics, along with all the basement rocks, were inverted and uplifted along uh, the Montreal River monocline during the inversion of the Mekong Rift, and the Jacobsville Formation was deposited in the erosional unconformity on top of the uh, monocline. And also the Jacobsville formation uh, is deformed and folded against the Keweenaw fault here. And so uh, Blake Hodgen, who was a postdoc in our group, um, and now assistant professor at Brown University, he developed new geochronology uh, data from the Jacobsville formation. So first he collected a detrital zircon sample from the Jacobsville formation and he reproduced these low precision dates, like uh, those uh, seen in Malone and all 2016 uh, by these large color bars. But he went ahead and then dated the youngest zircons in the, uh, in the sample by high precision CAID TIMS method. This method uh, mitigates let loss in the zircon grains and can achieve much higher precision. So here we can see the lower precision dates are these big ellipses. And each of them are paired by these tiny ellipses here with much higher precision and let loss control. And then we can see in the result the using this method, the maximum deposition age of these grains are actually 992.5 MA. And then we also collected um, fault breacher calcite from the hanging wall of the Keweenaw fault, along which the Jacobsville formation was folded and deformed. And these calcite look like this. So in the background, these are cracked of uh, ophitic basalt, and in it, in the crack, precipitated zeolite, and within zeolite, precipitated uh, fault calcite. And these calcite can be dated by uranium lead technique, and uh, uh, we have this isochron that defines an age of 985 plus minus, uh, plus minus 35 MA. And although this is low precision date, the nine, 985 MA age is consistent uh, with the regolith phase orogeny, peak metamorphism age um, of regolith phase orogeny of the Grand Valley orogeny. And so with the fault calcite date and the maximum deposition age defined by the detrital zircon from uh, the Jacobsville for, uh, formation, we know the Jacobsville formation deposition is circa 990 MA. And so we have solved the geochronology problem here. Um, uh, the next step, we look back to Roy, Robinson, Roy and Robertson's uh, paleomagnetic uh, experiment and data. And so at the time, they conducted a chemical cleaning experiment using um, 
uh, HCl acid, and they soaked those samples uh, in, in this acid uh, for up to 7,000 7, hours, and that translates about 10 months of chemical demagnetization. So it's a long, exp long experiment period. And also there was no uh, paleomagnetic field test at the time. But within the JSO formation in the field, we see abundant uh, interbedded siltstone and sandstone shown in these field images here. And some of them are uh, uh, along uh, waterfalls uh, in both ca uh, cases are shown here. And these siltstones and uh, fine-grained sandstone are uh, hematite bearing and they are uh, interbedded with um, uh, other hematite uh, poor sandstones. And so we collected these uh, siltstones and fine-grained sandstones performed high resolution thermal demagnetization uh, on them and isolated uh, chemical remnants uh, versus detrital remnants. And we obtained this uh, dual polarity detrital remnants plot shown on the right on the equator uh, plot. And I want to show with a intraformational conglomerate test uh, um, on both the chemical remnants component and the detrital remnants component uh, to show their, uh, uh, their age and result. Uh, so here I'm, sh I'm showing field images of these siltstone and fine-grained sandstone rip-up clasts within the JSO formation. And you can see this big siltstone uh, clasts within uh, the conglomerate uh, bed here. This is another one and here and also here that we sampled. And uh, the high-resolution uh, demagnetization uh, experiment um, was able to isolate th these two different components is because uh, the trital remnants component often carried by larger grained uh, hematite uh, versus chemical remnants component uh, carried by smaller grain size uh, pigmentary hematite. And because the grain size difference, they have unblocking temperature difference, where the chemical remnants component carry often have lower unblocking temperatures. And here I want to show in fiber optics, like all the red is um, orange colors are all. Uh, pigmentary hematite color shown in the sample. And in reflected light, you can see these larger bright grains are likely all uh, hematite, detrital hematite in here. And so uh, here I'm showing one of the uh, 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 demagnetization uh, result of a reoriented uh, uh, rip-up class in uh, the J-silver formation. And you can see uh, through the lower temperature demagnetization steps uh, as shown by this red arrow, we can isolate a component that is non-origin trending and often in the blocks uh, between 640 and 655 degree, degree C. And after that, with uh, demonization interval of two to three degree C, we can isolate another origin trending component shown in gray here that has higher unblocking temperature. And uh, combining the detrital uh, hematite, oh, combining these high temperature components, the gray color components from all uh, siltstone and fine grain sandstone rip up class, we can con conduct this um, conglomerate test. And show, uh, here, shown on the right, is that these high temperature components pass a um, conglomerate test. On the other hand, these red color components, whoops, they have well clustered directions and they fail a conglomerate test. And this is consistent with the interpretation that the lower temperature component is acquired by um, pigmentary hematite as chemical remnants versus the higher temperature component being a detrital in uh, origin. Okay, uh, so now uh, because the Jacobson formation is folded against the QAnon fault, we can also conduct a uh, fold test. Near to the fault, we can see this co coherent sandstone bed basically shooting up vertically toward the sky. But if you walk uh, further away from the fault, we see these uh, more flat-lying, shallowly dipping beds. So by collecting uh, specimens from these steeply dipping beds and also these more shallowly dipping beds, we can conduct a fault test to further constrain uh, um, the, uh, the timing of uh, the detrital remnants component. So here I'm showing uh, in geographic coordinates on the left, uh, two corrected coordinates in the middle, the trital uh, remnants components uh, from 
uh, a, a stratigraphic section along the geophysical formation. And here they pass a fault test. And therefore, the Jacobsville acquired DRM um, prior to folding. And also, speaking of inclination, um, shallowing a correction for sedimentary um, um, uh, directions, uh, here we applied the EI method uh, to a uh, total of about, about uh, 300 uh, specimen DRM directions and obtained a nominal effect of 0 0.65. But we do have a spread of uh, effect uh, uh, given by 95 um, confidence interval from 0 0.85 to 0 0.52. And to represent this range of possible effects, we followed the method that we worked with James Pierce um, uh, and published last year. Now he is at uh, Yale, uh, Yale University. And so we compile this um, viable effect um, and, uh, and correct uh, our uh, uh, DRM uh, directions by all of these effects and convert into pole space. And then we summarize the uncertainty uh, uh, of the mean pole position with a Kent distribution. And so the resultant uh, paleomagnetic pole uh, represented by a Kent distribution for the Jacobs formation is shown here. And this corresponds to an age of 990 MA. And so we'll quickly reveal uh, the the and and track uh, plate motion of Laurentia from 11, 1109 MA to uh, 1075 MA, uh, the uh, Laurentia experienced rapid uh, plate tectonic motion of up to 25 centimeters per year. But afterwards, after the Kiwanawan track from uh, 1075 to 990 MA, we can see Laurentia relatively uh, slowed down uh, significantly and uh, the uh, plate reconstruction um, uh, paleogeography model is shown on the on the right. Um, this is uh, almost an order of magnitude a decrease in average speed uh, for Laurentia after the Kiwanawan track. And so, if we plot back these uh, Grenville province uh, paleomagnetic pole back onto this pole plot, we can see we know the Jacobsville pole is well constrained to be circa 990 MA. But previously, the, the Grenville poles were thought to be uh, uh, 1015 to 960 MA. However, these pole position and the Jacobsville pole position are quite far. And so this led us to go ahead and uh, revisit uh, the age and paleomagnetic pole uh, developed uh, for the Grenville poles in the previous literature. And so here I'm citing Warnock et al. in 2000 on the Halliburton intrusions, and here are some orthogonal vector diagram um, demagnetization plots from their, from their study. And we can see these magnetite bearing uh, Granville rocks on block um, uh, between 580 to down to 500 degrees C. Um, but the interpretation in that paper says uh, the magnetite were unblocked and in situ temperature uh, of 555 plus minus five degrees C. I mean, that study, they paired this interpretation with uh, their uranium lead titanite uh, geochronology ages and uh, argon argon based hornblende ages and interpreted that these unblocking uh, temperature for uh, those magnetite correspond, uh, can be dated by um, bracketing uh, this age between the age of hornblende uh, ages and titanite ages. And the interpretation is uh, these. Uh, pole ages are associated with 10, 15 MA acquisition. And uh, using a similar approach, uh, Brown and McEnroe, McEnroe in uh, 2012 developed magnetite uh, uh, thermodynamization data on uh, magnetite bearing anorthocytic and granitic rocks from the Adirondack Highlands in upper state New York. And they used Metzger et al's 1991 thermal history model. Uh, to estimate uh, the age of these uh, remnants and concluded that these remnants were acquired around 990 MA to 960 MA. And so here I'm replotting uh, X axis age and older ages on the left side, younger ages on the right um, side, and, uh, and the Y axis is, is temperature. And so the Metzger at all 1991 age is shown, um, shown again. So, uh, Magnetite on blocking temperature uh, uh, bar, uh, how do you say it? Um, 
so so the, the age interpretation uh, that uh, the interpretation that uh, the, the time through which the magnetite on block through uh, uh, in, in these Granville rocks uh, are mapped onto about uh, a thousand MA. But we uh, went ahead and collected new rocks uh, from the Adirondack Highlands and developed more precise uh, 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 geochronology and uh, paired um, uh, 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 paired um, a, a minor uh, uh, element data that can provide us with temperature estimates from the from metamorphic zircons and also uh, titanites that both show um, ages around 1000 MA, but a much higher temperature around 700 degrees C. And we also focus on developing uh, high precision uh, dates from apatite grains uh, from these uh, same rocks. And we acquired uranium apatite thermochronology dates um, around 860 MA. And these apatite thermochronology has uh, overlapping um, closure temperatures with the unblocking temperature of the magnetite. And more specifically, we can plot up these uh, ages with the grain size uh, of appetite. And because we have such high age resolution using uh, Tim's method, we can see this nice cross, uh, correlation between grain size and age. And this is consistent uh, with uh, these appetite having experienced volume diffusion of lead loss uh, uh, during the slow cooling of the origin. And so these appetite ages give us a sense that we probably need to modify the age assignment of the uh, at least the Adirondack Highlands paleomagnet pose by up to 100 million years. And so in summary, uh, in this study, we constrain the geochronology of Jacob formation uh, that its deposition was around uh, 990 MA. Jacob formation has primary uh, detrital remnants magnetization uh, confirmed both by the positive intraformational conglomerate test and the fold test. Um, and the resultant pole position from the Jacob formation uh, show that Laurentia significantly slowed down after the onset of the Granvillian um, orogeny. And finally, with a new uh, poll from the Jacobsville formation and the new geochronology data we developed from uh, the Adirondack Highlands, uh, we hypothesized that the Granville poles are younger than previously uh, thought. And we're excited to develop new paleomagnetic and thermochronology data from uh, more of the Granville rocks. And I will leave it there. Very nice talk. Thank you very much. Um, I was just just out of curiosity. So you have this very rapid southward motion of um, uh, of Laurentia, and in one of your earliest slides, I think you showed that there was a fraction of Virginia that on the north side there was the China. Here, uh, uh, there were other countries there. Anyway. Yeah, other yeah, countries? yeah. Here, so North North China is on the on the, on the north side of Laurentia. So do you see that rapid southward race of Laurentia also in North China? And if not, how did you get there? I think uh, Shihong's group, they published uh, a compilation of polls from, uh, from, I think from North China that aligns with the Kibunawan track pretty well. And I think their argument is they were moving together, moving if I remember together. correctly. Yeah, so yeah. That, yeah, and that's where that big present position the, the cross-reticography of this unit report, but there's a swath of terraform wonder path that's actually the same thing that just leads to that research. Because the reason I'm asking is, I was wondering, I presume that in Gravillian Lorogeny, the subduction polarity is south, the weight from the energy, right? Yeah. yeah. But are there, were there also subduction nodes in the morning? And because that would require that they would migrate to the mountain like they Oh, yeah. Oh. Hmm. Not that it's not. Uh, I guess why the DRM and the CRM have different unblocking temperatures. Can you go through that? Oh, yeah. 
So on the left, I think it's, it's a plot of, uh, 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 based on your theory, on um, grain size versus on um, blocking temperature for hematite, spherical hematite. And so uh, as you go from uh, 100 nanometer grain size hematite up to 600 or even bigger uh, uh, grain size, the predicted on um, blocking temperature goes up. And because here we can see in the photography images, these uh, detrital hematite are usually large grains the, the, on, the, on this scale is probably 10 micron, a micron is in size versus these pigmentary red color, uh, fine grained nanometer scale uh, hematite. Uh, we, you expect them to have uh, lower temperatures for these ones than detrital hematite. Hi, nice job. Um, I'm just curious about a minor point in your talk about the Warnock paper. Oh, yes. And and that was one of my students. Um, OK, yeah. And you said yeah, it, we suggested it was 1015. Are you throwing that out? Because the original age on that before we did our work was 980. And right. then you said the grain the loop things were younger. Right. Right. So what, what was your point there? I guess my point is, OK, so if these uh, Halliburton pole is 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 in this pile, but if these uh, blue color age poles are ten fifteen, okay. uh, and and these uh, the uh, the Jacobson formation pole is nine ninety ma, how can I explain the pole discrepancy? Yeah, yeah. If if they're older, what does that mean? But if if they are older, uh, did um, the Granville uh, rocks move significantly after uh, nine ninety, or after yeah. Right. To 1015. And this pole dis uh, distance is quite quite large. I think I calculated it's 30 degrees, 20 degrees. That maps to uh, 2,000, 3,000 kilometers. Right. Uh, I mean, could... Suggesting Lori Brown to the back of the yeah. younger. Yeah, I, th I think those ages are probably also too old. Um, here. So they, uh, so, so using. These central, central, these are central uh, highlands rocks. And using these hornblende ages, biotite ages, and up here, I think the garnet um, ages, uh, uh, they think this is 950. Uh, I think that's, uh, uh, that's closer or, or perhaps um, um, towards more ag agreement with the Jacobson pole formation. But if we develop more, I would love to see more uh, appetite thermochronology dates from those rocks. Is that is that nine fifty or maybe eight fifty? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah. So a question with uh, I would love to talk uh, to people with more um, expertise on uh, say argon argon horn blend argon argon biotite mm -hmm. uh, methods and potentially maybe recompile or reanalyze re those data and see what could have happened. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? You want to really fast translations. Do a really slow translation. Oh, yeah. Uh, I would say Grenville and uh, Rajni, it was a really uh, a massive scale, Himalayan scale Rajni that happened around uh, the present day eastern and likely southern margin uh, of Florentia. Uh, and it, it happened. Uh, from the peak metamorphism um, um, age compilation, it uh, lasted from nine, uh, 10, 1090 to 980. Or, like, it started uh, uh, even before this, the, the, the slowdown in the, in the latter half of the key neuron track. So we kind of can see this uh, slowdown in plate speed already um, around uh, 1095, 1097. Yeah, like a great at 1060. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you.